Uh, hello, welcome back. We are very excited and proud to introduce uh, the next speaker, Stan Scholl. Stan is a leading expert of the space industry in Washington State. He is also one of our great collaborators and champions. He is founder and principal consultant at Alliance Velocity, where he advises space and software companies on growth, partnership, and exit strategies. He has worked on many civilian and military space initiatives, as well as NASA's space station program. At Boeing, he directed R&D and corporate strategic planning and led an initiative to develop an aerospace data and analytics business through joint ventures and acquisitions. He developed, negotiated, and managed dozens of strategic partnerships and played a key role in four successful exits by acquisition or IPO. This is a great opportunity for us to ask Stan about a recent study he did on various aspects of the Pacific Northwest aerospace ecosystem. And for all of our attendees, remember you can enter your questions in the Q&A there on Whova. And um, we should definitely have time for a few. I see that there are some uh, showing up in there already. Thank you for that. And um, so with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and launch into it. And we're gonna do this kind of uh, in a moderator format. So I'll ask Stan questions and then he'll answer them. And um, I'm sure we'll get a little free form there after a bit, but we'll just start off with, um, okay, so Stan, Tell us a bit about the Washington space sector. So who are some of the key players and what are some of the interesting programs these companies are driving? Okay, thanks, Christy. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and join in another fabulous uh, space symposium uh, put on by the University of Washington. So let me, let me share a, a slide with you that some of the folks on the call probably have seen from me before. Um, here, I can do this. Hopefully you can see this slide now. Yes. So um, this is sort of a logo shot I put together to sort of give a picture of the Washington State space ecosystem. And I try to keep it up to date and it probably does not include everybody, but um, one of the first things you'll notice as you look at the space ecosystem here locally is that it really is quite broad. In other words, the space companies we have in Washington State cover the entire space and satellite value chain whether it's building spacecraft and components or launching satellites and spacecraft, operating satellites in space, um, and, and providing sort of the new and emerging market around on-orbit servicing, assembly and manufacturing. And then the critical piece of getting the telecommunications or Earth observation data back to Earth and turning them into usable products. And it's that right-hand side of the um, equation there that really drives um, the revenue that makes the rest of the space industry possible. So there's also space tourism and other interesting markets um, that we are represented here by companies in the greater Seattle and Washington state area. So it's pretty broad. Um, we've heard about uh, some of the companies on this call uh, on this conference earlier today already. I think just to mention a few, and I hate to do this because I can't talk about all of them, but just to give a sense, Obviously, Blue Origin is the largest uh, by employment in our state. Uh, it, it's probably about half of the total employment in our state from a space perspective, excluding the supply chain. And they, of course, build rockets and rocket engines and, and uh, working on human landers for the moon and um, now an orbital habitat as well as space station. So a very comprehensive space company there. Uh, SpaceX and Amazon are both building um, large satellite constellations. Now, SpaceX, as you heard today from Ari, has already launched uh, actually more than 1,700 satellites, or about 1,700, which is more than a third of all the satellites operating in space today. This has gone up from zero um, just about three years ago, so pretty phenomenal. And SpaceX has a, a valuation now of $100 billion uh, in the private capital markets, and I can assure you that that valuation, if there's any logic to it, it is not based on their rocket launching business, which is a very small uh, market overall compared to the rest of this. It is based on the assumption that SpaceX will be successful with this broadband internet constellation and will generate tens of billions of dollars. So the SpaceX of the future, the core of that business is really the heartbeat of that business is really here in Washington state. And Amazon Project Kuiper, Amazon being the only company on earth that could create a $10 billion, 3000 satellite constellation and call it a project. Um, but uh, Project Kuiper will be joining, uh, joining SpaceX there. So for right now, at least, um, and more, many more satellites will be coming online here, but for now, at least we're the satellite capital of the world. Um, and then we've got a number of fantastic startups can't mention them all, but you know I'll talk about Starfish Space, which is working on a space tug, um, Stoke Space, which is really working on the next generation 
a reusable launch, Explore, which is helping um, all kinds of users bring data on their instruments, sort of space as a service back from satellites, whether in Earth orbit or out beyond in the solar system. Um, Wave Motion, another launch company, RBC Signals for um, ground station as a service. So a lot of large and small companies that really complete this. And then we have a fantastic supporting cast in terms of education and research organizations, UW, PNNL, um, advocacy and entrepreneur organizations as well. So it's a pretty phenomenal, I'd say it's a, a modest but mighty um, space ecosystem here. Okay, this is great. So this leads into a good follow on question, which pulls a little bit from one of the online questions. Uh, and then also one that I had had, which is, um, you know, given this scope, and if you want to stop sharing your screen, we were seeing like, yeah, I need power. to figure out how to do that. Something just happened here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Technology. Yeah, um, it's the humans. It's the human in the loop. It's the problem human. in this case. Yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> sector of technology. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you, we've got a little bit of a sense of the size and scale of our space sector in Washington. How does that specifically compare to some of the other space hubs in the US? And, and this um, leads a little bit into some of the questions here uh, in Whova. And so there was a question about um, whether Seattle can really become known as a hub for entrepreneurial space activity. And, um, you know, I would say like some of the other places, you know, so we have Colorado, Houston, obviously Florida is where a lot of things launch from and same thing in California. So can, can we make it? Yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, let me just say it's very rapidly growing. So, um, so about three, four years ago, three years ago, I think the Puget Sound Regional Council did a study of the space industry here and said maybe there were around 3,000 employees and a billion, 1.2 billion of direct economic output. Um, I've been looking at these numbers pretty closely over the last three years. And I think that has certainly more than doubled in terms of uh, headcount and possibly tripled or more in terms of the economic impact. So billions of dollars are flowing in here now through SpaceX and Amazon's $10 billion investments in their constellations, Blue Origin getting more than $200 million a year from NASA, as well as financing from Jeff Bezos and, and other things. So the money's flowing in, it's growing very rapidly. Um, I think it's certainly much smaller than, say, the, the, some of the clusters that you mentioned, Christy. It's certainly not the size of um, some of the space clusters that have a large federal presence, whether that's at Kennedy Space Center or Johnson Space Center, so Florida and Texas. Also, in terms of startups, we don't have the um, number of startups, say, that Silicon Valley has in space. But I do think we have um, a unique opportunity to that question that came in to be a leader in terms of entrepreneurial space. And the, the reason I think that is because it's the ecosystem here is very homegrown. Um, without a federal presence here, without an office, uh, a NASA center or a US Space Force office, the ecosystem here has grown up and has been very sort of commercial and entrepreneurial from the beginning. So I, I think that we have a lot of the key elements needed to grow what could be a very significant entrepreneurial space cluster. And I think that does, along with that breadth of coverage, um, the satellite, um, the fact that we integrate cloud computing and the satellite networks here, I think those things make us pretty unique. Excellent. That, that addressed what my next question was going to be. What really is our, our specialness or secret sauce here in the Northwest, specifically in the Puget Sound? Um, and let me... Well, let me... Let me just mention one thing more about that, Chrissy. I think it's yeah. important to talk about for a minute this cloud uh, satellite integration. So um, I think maybe some people on this call know, but both Amazon and Microsoft are building out uh, satellite ground station businesses. Mm -hmm. And they both have as well space-focused business units. And the reason they're doing this is because it's critically important from a perspective of using these satellite constellations to get data to a, a cloud-based data center, whether it's enterprise data or whether it's the Earth observation data that we heard about earlier today on that panel, whether it's the synthetic aperture radar or electro-optical or radio frequency data, all of that needs to be uh, brought into some kind of um, computing infrastructure where you can apply analytics and AI and machine learning and, and turn that into usable products that mere mortals without a PhD in their business or government offices can, can do good with that space data like we talked about. So, so I think that cloud satellite integration is pretty important. We've seen SpaceX 
partner with Microsoft here, the Microsoft Azure, for instance, to mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. So we are the cloud leader here, Cloud City in Seattle area with Microsoft, uh, Azure and Amazon Web Services having more than 60% of the cloud market share. And we're now, you know, a satellite leader as well and bringing those two things together. So I think that's a fairly uh, unique thing to, to make mention of. Yeah, and let's let's touch on that a little bit more because I think um, you know a number of us do feel quite strongly, um, and I and I want to make sure we get that message out there that you know there's a very unique intersection here in the Puget Sound area, which is the the aerospace, which can be both the sort of historical, long-standing anchor tenants as well as the manufacturing which is where the sat so satellites like you said are getting manufactured here at multiple sizes not all the way up to the super big ones so not geo scale but um lots and lots of smaller satellites and then that data science which again is like a long-standing um industry base here in the pacific northwest do you have some thoughts on what um what we can really do with that or or you know, do we need to do more with that or do we just need to get the word out there? Like, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, when I think about, um, when I think about a, a typical new space company or a modern space company, I see a lot of them are really a mashup of aerospace manufacturing and IT soft and, uh, and software. And, you know, in fact, I look back to um, 2015 and Elon Musk came out to Washington State and Redmond and sort of launched the SpaceX Starlink office there. And he talked specifically about the need. He said, you folks don't seem to want to move to Southern California, so I have to come here, um, which speaks to one uh, advantage we have. But he said specifically he needed to try to recruit engineers from places like Microsoft, Boeing, and Blue Origin. So bringing together software, manufacturing at scale, and sort of aerospace engineering and design or space specific engineering and design. So I see that mashup um, happening in most space companies uh, today. And then when you look at the intersection of particularly software and IT and space, you know, you can hardly not be a modern space company without a high percentage of your value add coming from software. And I think it, it comes in a number of areas. So first of all, there's the digital design manufacturing simulation that happens up front. And then there's the software in the products and services themselves, whether it's a satellite that's software defined or with radio so that are software defined so they're configurable. And then you get to the autonomy that's needed to operate robotically in space. And then the artificial intelligence that's required to orchestrate constellation of satellites and then uh, networks uh, of communication. So that's very big. And then lastly, I think it comes to the, which I touched on before, the artificial intelligence and machine learning required to take all this fabulous data that we're getting from space about our planet, our climate, disaster relief, how to be more efficient, solve pollution, all of these, these data sources and turn them into something that can be uh, used to actually um, get the value out. So I think if you can't throw a stone in the space industry without hitting something where software analytics, machine learning, autonomy is just critical. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, also good for us to, in academia to hear that since we're the ones that have to help train that. Um, I'm gonna keep my eye here on some of the questions in our chat and let me just see. Um, let's see, okay, so we've talked, and I'm gonna take a little bit of a pivot here. So we've talked a good bit about like, what are our strengths currently, which I think are pretty good. Uh, and I, I mean, I think we hear a lot about what we do with the manufacturing, but a little bit in the direction of some of the things that we either have not been known for doing too much or um, are just starting to do. And this is actually coming off of one of the questions here from one of our medical community members, um, which is talking about like the biomedical side of the whole space industry, bioastronautics, which um, I would say other, other of these hubs are known a bit more for, but we've just seen some reports coming out about um, with the Russian astronauts, like there was marker, there were markers of brain damage in um, those astronauts who were up for like five and a half months. And yet at the same time, we're talking about sending people, many people out to space, out to Mars. Um, so first of all, your thoughts on that, but then also like, how do you think like Seattle could, the Seattle Puget Sound area, Washington state could get a foothold there? 
Yeah, yeah. So I, obviously, I think if we intend to, and I hope we do, uh, as a as a human race, to explore and, and develop space and and send people further out into the solar system, these are challenges we need to to get our hands around. I'm not um, aware of a whole lot of um, initiatives in the commercial sector here in Washington State that are directly addressing those. Now, there is uh, one thing to, to to keep in mind is that space is dangerous and and difficult. And so um, there are some times where you want to have um, robotics and autonomous systems working. And we do have great companies, whether it's Olus Robotics or Starfish or Tethers Unlimited who are working um, in those areas. So, but set, set, setting that aside, I think that the um, where the rubber meets the road on these kind of questions really is more in the research phase. So I feel like this is a, a really important role that the university can play um, and, and our government institutions like NASA and others who are, are doing the research on this area. I, it's hard to see how there's near-term commercial value um, in some of these areas, but without that research, we won't be able to get the long-term commercial value and, uh, and just you know, achieve the inspirational value of, of exploring with humans. Yeah, and I think, um... That's a really good point that, you know, we can really look to have a strength in being partners, like through the various universities and schools that we have. There's the Joint Center for Aerospace Technology and Innovation that's here. It helps do, it helps with some seed funding, although that tends to be a little bit further along. It's not usually like early stage development. Um, but yeah, and so what I'm gonna do next I'm kind sure, of- I'm sure, Blue or I'm sure Blue Origin is probably putting some, I don't know specifically, but I'd be surprised with their with uh, their long-term vision and their efforts on habitats, I, I'd be surprised if they don't have some people that are looking into this as well. Yeah, well, and there's Orbit, so right. oh, um, true, true. That's, yep. that's, you know, getting up and running right now right. for training people to go into space. So I'm sure that they have some thoughts, mm -hmm. although I, we don't actually have either of them here today, but, you know, we, did on last we can, year. We can did set on last them up year. for a, a dialogue in the future. Um, so, uh, kind of following on this so we've got um we've got our educational institutions here and um you know we're working on creating the workforce and can you say a little bit about i'm going to ask a couple of different things here so how is the workforce looking in washington state like how are we doing there i know you have a slide on that too if you want yeah to. i probably won't pull up any more slides as i'll i'll, I'll <laughs> screw that up but but the um, so I do keep track of sort of how many uh, jobs are open in the space sector. I've been doing so for the last 18 months or so. It's important to remember when you look at these numbers that the number of open jobs could be up for good reasons and bad reasons. They could be up because the space uh, economy is growing here. They could also be up because um, companies can't hire employees. And so these jobs are staying open for a long period of time or they have a retention issue or some other reason. But broadly speaking, um, you know, it, it's showing growth. So when I started about a year and a half ago, there were about 700 open positions in the space economy here. And it fell to under 400 uh, as the pandemic got underway and, and about a year ago. And now we're north of 1300 open space jobs. A lot of them at Blue Origin, um, the majority actually at Blue Origin right now, <clears throat> but even the non, even the rest of the space companies have more than doubled their open positions in the last 12 months. So it suggests significant growth but it also is apparent to me that they're having a hard time filling those jobs uh, based on some of the research that I've done um, and some work I did with Aerospace Futures Alliance. Um, it's clear that, that, that it's a bottleneck is getting people. And when you look at the, what types of jobs they are most, they're most hiring for, it tends to be engineering. So while they need people from all functions and all skill levels, around 70% the last time I did a snapshot, which was uh, more than six months ago, but, uh, was for, for engineering talent. And that's uh, a, a clearly a, a, a need that they're not filling today. And it's certainly impacting the growth. And, and as a result, we're kind of a net importer of employees here in the state of Washington. Yeah, and we have a couple of questions. Um, I, I think some of these might be from a, some of our students here wanting um, a little bit of information about what what makes for an appealing applicant. So these, um, I don't know if these are undergraduates or graduate students. Um, so you've spoken to their, you know, they're looking really for engineering. Um, you know, there's a question about whether internship experience is preferred. I would say I, I, as an educator, yes, they are all looking for internship experience. We have data on that from our career center, internships equals jobs at graduation. 
take any internship to start. Don't get too picky, get an internship. That'll get you the better one the next time. Um, and then, um, oh shoot, there was another question. They move around over here. I forgot to pin them. Um, Let me speak to that. Let me speak to that real quickly on the internship. So one of the things we heard from space uh, companies when um, we did this uh, study for the AFA I mentioned was that they, they definitely need engineers, but there's also this challenge they have with people with, who, who have hands-on experience and are a little further along in their career. So the issue, as you can imagine, the space, comp space industry is growing very rapidly. And um, it's in some ways, the employment base or the workforce in the space industry is kind of a barbell shape where you have a lot of experienced people at the near the end of their careers who are retiring and a lot of young people with passion energy and brilliant IQ who are jumping in and they're kind of missing some of that interim capability. So what that says to me is the more hands-on experience you can have, um, a technical and business hands-on experience. And, uh, and then I think there's a role for educational institutions of all varieties to help um, people progress more quickly in their careers. There was a, um, a fantastic show on Netflix, if you haven't seen it, uh, called Countdown, which is a four episode show about the recent inspiration for crew mission um, uh, to space with Haley Arsenault and, and, and Dr. Proctor and, 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 and some other folks, and including the gentleman from Washington State. And um, fantastic show. And if you look at the SpaceX engineers who are driving this human space flight, I mean, these people are so young and so brilliant. And I just think what a great time to enter the space industry. I wish I had been born not when I was, but about 20 years later, because um, now is a fantastic time to be entering the space industry and uh, and starting a career because the opportunities are tremendous. Yeah, and I would just say, so if, if that was a student, by all means, reach out at the various schools, you know, the Washington NASA Space Grant Consortium has all kinds of opportunities for getting um, started on that experience. So we don't expect people to come in having lots and lots of hands-on experience. Um, and then a related question from one of the students, and I'm not sure how far we can get with this one, but I wanna put it out there because it's the top voting one at the moment, um, was um, as a student hoping to work here in Washington, what are some of the less well-known private companies that are hiring? Do you have an answer to that? Yeah. And you so said some of the bigger ones. Yeah, I have a, I keep a, a list of them on my website. So I'll, I'll drop in the okay. chat later, a link to that. You can look at all the companies <clears throat> and if you haven't heard of them, check them out, but, um, or you can look at that logo slide and, and, you know, some of these companies are only have four or five or six positions open, but, you know, I think there's real value in getting to know them and what they're doing, possibly trying to network and, and meet some of the, the key players at those companies. Companies like Explore, Starfish, Stoke, USNC Tech. Um, these are companies that are all hiring right now. Spaceflight, probably better well known with their, their rideshare service to space. Um, providing uh, launch opportunities. Uh, they're all hiring. Black Sky is hiring here locally. Um, so there are a lot of these companies which maybe only have a 10 to a few hundred employees that are hiring. And so um, they're, they're pretty easy to find, but I'll put my web, web link out there. Yeah. And then I would also say um, from the faculty perspective and the, the department chair perspective, um, so particularly the smaller companies, they don't necessarily hire on like sort of a standard cycle, like some of the larger companies do. Yeah. So I, I would say like, just always try and be on the lookout. We do when, when um, job information comes through, we always send it into our career center. So things are posted in one location, but um, yeah, Stan has a great list of things. And, and I would say also be creative with the options because you know, aerospace is supported from a variety of disciplines. So you can connect into it from a variety of places. So another, another thing to do, we do have a really great sort of, um, if you think of space entrepreneurship as a funnel, even if you don't intend to start up your own space company, we have a lot of, at this top of this entrepreneurial funnel where you take sort of entrepreneurs or people interested in space careers, we have some great supporting organizations in our region, which will help you with networking. So there's the Space Entrepreneurs Group run by Sean McClinton, which has about a thousand members. Um, there's the, um, the work of Mike Doyle and um, James Burke, who've got space data hackers and the NASA space apps uh, hackathon activity and startup weekend space. So there's a variety of these um, things that you can join up to, to meet people and talk to people and get the lay of the land. And hopefully that becomes more feasible in the near future for in-person, more in-person events. But I would take advantage of that to the maximum extent. I think for some engineers, 
Um, we're not naturally good at that kind of thing, um, generalizing, which is a big mistake. But, but you know, I think that's super valuable, and it's a very, it's a pretty, in my, it's my experience, is a very open community. Everyone's passionate about space and welcomes anybody who shares that passion. So I think uh, it's a great way to get started. Yeah, I would agree entirely. Um, let's see here. So here's one that's a little bit different, but I think interesting given all the conversations we've had today. So as there is a Google for search on the internet, what is the most comparable resource to search data in the public sec uh, space sector from remote sensing, weather, and incidence analysis perspective? Like, how do you get the data, I guess, is really where that question is. Yeah, boy, I'm not an expert on that. If I thought about it, I could probably come up with a few. There are, there are co commercial companies um, that um, you know, are trying to, to aggregate some of this data from different sources and make it more usable, but it usually comes with a, a hefty awesome. license fee, right? It's companies like a Skywatch or someone who will take data from the Mac stars and the planets and put it all together. Um, you know, some of these companies do provide some free and open data that you can get. NASA publishes a lot of data so that NASA space apps, um, that space hackathon that I mentioned, they take advantage of NASA data to, to try to help solve problems that benefit uh, life here on earth. So I think there are some of those sources, but I think maybe that's a follow-up I could provide more help later. Yeah, and NOAA's data is uh, yeah. available as well. Yeah. Um, it, you just have to be able to kind of sort your way through it. Right. I, I will say it is not low barrier because <laughs> I've dealt with well, it. We, when there are people in the community here. I mean, there's there's folks who work at um, at, at Black Sky and other uh, companies. There's, I mentioned Mike Doyle and others who are thought leaders in this in this area here locally. So we can get you, we can get you answers. Yeah. Okay. Let me just make sure I didn't miss any of those questions over there. Okay. And so uh, I am keeping my eye on the time here. Um, what would you say in terms of sort of given all of this in your perspective, what can we best be doing to help drive and grow this regional space sector that we have here? I mean, you've mentioned the need for sort of like a, a federal presence would really be a differentiator from where we are right now. Is there anything beyond yeah, I mean, that? When, when you look at the strengths we have, whether it's our, our, our workforce, our universities, the supply chain, um, the pillar companies, those are all things which are hard to replicate and we already have them. I think the areas where we weak, fortunately, are things that we can address. So it's the federal presence, if we get our federal legislators working on that. It's a better, a better engagement from our mainstream venture capital community here in terms of space. Um, we do have some, uh, com some pretty prolific space investors here, but the mainstream VC community has not uh, dipped its toe in the space water yet here locally. Um, so that's the one thing. And then I think as a, as a region, we should do a better job of understanding that we're competing with Colorado, New Mexico, Florida, Texas. You know, on, on today's um, uh, call, I think there's a gentleman named Drayden Kreft, who is a, a native who went out to Mississippi and got his, his law degree there with a concentration in space policy. And while he was there, he co-authored a study for Mississippi on what every one of the 50 states are doing in terms of economic development for space. Mississippi knows they're competing. Do we in Washington know that we're competing? And I'd like to see a little more collaborative energy around driving, uh, driving our region forward. And I think my, my take is there are four things that we should focus on for our space companies. And those would be business development. Everybody needs to grow. Workforce development. Um, uh, that's really critical. Um, entrepreneurial support, because that's where the growth in our space industry here is going to come from and then marketing uh, Washington as a space state. Um, a few years back, Casey Dreyer, who's the chief advocate at the Planetary Society said, Washington is a space state that just doesn't know it yet. I think we <laughs> now kind of know it here, but I don't think the rest of the world knows it yet and we need to help um, make sure everyone does. Yeah, well, I would say those are those are viable things. I know I've, I've had conversations with some of the the AFA people about a, a big presence at um, like the, the air shows, not Dubai, but that'd be fun. But you know, the next one will be Farnborough, which I think next summer can be in person. So we could really, you know, put a flag in the ground. Um, we are right at the end of our time. So do you have any final thoughts you want to share with us? I think it's been fantastic. No, I, I guess the only thing I would say, there was a recent, actually it was an AFA summit last week. I think that Brian Ryder, who's the CTO of Leo Stella said, let's not miss this moment. And I, I think we have here um, 
for the United States, for humanity, for Washington State, an opportunity to really um, take advantage of what we've got going here with this new growing commercial space arena and, and make it something that, that benefits all of us. So let's not miss this moment. Um, uh, let's go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stan. This has been fantastic. Um, it's been great to learn so much about our, um, our regional strengths and the entry points and what we need to focus on as educators and entrepreneurs and industry leaders. It's been a great morning and we also have an excellent afternoon planned for everyone. So right now there's going to be a bit of a break, about an hour long break. So you can go grab some lunch, go visit the exhibition and sponsor halls, do some networking. I will say there are a lot of posters in there that came from the students who've been funded out of the Washington NASA Space Grant Consortium. And so they are actually from all over the state, some of them. Um, and uh, there's also, remember our sponsors, so Salal and then Aerovironment. So speaking of, um, you know, the helicopter, they're, they're the ones that built that. Uh, and um, just give another big thank you to everybody who's been involved so far. And we will reconvene here at 1 p.m. for our next panel on propulsion. So we'll see you there. <laughs>